So you will see, but uh, quantum thermal is really a nice playground to, to use. Can we, is it possible to switch on the lights? Somehow it's, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I wrote here some uh, references. Um, I will mostly talk about what is in these two works here and later I will go maybe some brief mention of this and of this one. And uh, this is uh, like kind of theoretical background that is needed sometimes to understand what I will talk about. And this might be needed for this. Well, this is just some references for, for in case you know, but it should be fairly clear. I'll try to go um, step by step. So what is the general framework? We, we think of uh, thermal machines. Uh, in, this, in this scenario, you can imagine that you have some, um, some system that sometimes we, we, we call working fluid uh, that you can control in the sense that um, you can control its Hamiltonian in time via some parameters and you can attach it to different thermal baths. so on, you can attach it and detach it from different thermal baths and you can perform operations, transformations on, on, the, on, the, on the Hamiltonian in general by just driving the parameters in time of the Hamiltonian. And so we will be in the very uh, standard framework of these driven thermal machines and also the couplings with the different thermal baths. We will assume they, they are just represented by some uh, master equation, meaning that uh, the evolution of the system is given by some uh, Limbladian that depends on the, on the temperature, to on, on the given bath, and it usually satisfies, uh, well, for example, let's say L1, the Limbladian when I am attached to bath one is such that uh, the evolution of the thermal state at temperature one, well, the, the steady state of, of this evolution is the thermal state at temperature one, which is simply, you know, E so, so this is just a very, very, very standard framework. And well, we will start by considering cases in which actually the machine is attached only to one bath at a time. So uh, for each uh, moment in time, the evolution will be given by something like this. Um, so yeah, I guess there is uh, uh, not much to say again. And OK, yes, so. And how times that it's not attached to any bath? Yes. Yes. So typically what will happen is that we, you, you will consider, like in uh, classical thermodynamics, cycles in which there is, some, there is an isotherm, so it's, you are attached to the bath during the isotherm, and maybe there is what I think in classical thermodynamics is called isocore uh, or adiabatic, in which you, you actually you detach the system from any bath and you just change the Hamiltonian and like, things like this. Okay, so in, uh, again, uh, in this very... Um, canonical framework, the internal energy of the system is this, and the split in, uh, in work and, and heat of the variation of energy is, we consider it to be the canonical one. So this is uh, canonical choice. So by the way, the, the, the convention we choose for the sign of the work is the work that, is, that goes inside the system and similarly for the, for the heat, right? So this is the general, very, very general framework and somehow we want to define also... Yeah, it's quite, uh, I would say, in, uh, I don't know, last uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, uh, in term. So one way you can convince yourself of this, well, very vaguely, one way is just saying, okay, yes, the heat should be the energy change due to the variation of entropy, for example, of the system. 
and you can see that this one is the piece that is associated to variation of entropy. Or you can split, essentially you can in consider transformations in which the, the system is detached by, from any, any buff. So in such transformations in which only the Hamiltonian changes, um, this, is, um, the, this is the change of energy and this should be work. While in other transformations in which actually you don't touch the system, and the only, so dh is zero if you want, the only, the only other, uh, the energy will come from, from the dynamics, so from the thermalization to the bats, and we, you will have only this. So uh, is that way. Does that work in the same way, way of the, the capacity to lift a weight or something like that? Well, that can yes, so this is, uh, yeah, so this is implicit, an, an, an implicit uh, definition. In principle, you should be able, so you, you assume that the controls that you have in your, in your lab are somehow connected to some uh, lifting weight system. So somehow, yes, this energy flows from the controls in a way. So this is like, a, yeah, so this is canonical. Is it, is the Hamiltonian is like a magnetic field? It, it's pulling back from that. Yes. So it, it kind of is the same. It's just going to become the same because the amount of work depends on the state, right? I mean, so it, yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, the amount of work depends on the state, yes. Yeah, imagine, imagine that there's two level systems and there's particles in the second level and you lift this level. Now this, this thing is like charging the battery because it could go down from the system and emit energy which you could. Yeah, this is a formulation that I know. But this yes. is like equivalent to this. Yes. Yeah. So I think there are in principle works that try to justify this. Yeah, so there is a there you can't use the Hamiltonian or you can use the Hamiltonian that commute with some some given Hamiltonian for energy for the top system. What sorry? Thank you. I know I've got a formulation of conduct thermodynamics and you have a Hamiltonian for the whole system mm -hmm. or whatever, and you can switch some things that commute with this. But you can only switch on enough things that commute with that, and then uh, okay. and then the goal is to lift a weight uh, using this kind of ideas, right? And yes. Some yeah. What? Well, this, this you no, know, this is just. I would say a general framework in which you assume that you can do any transformation on the Hamiltonian, and then in principle it's true that you should find. Uh, you don't have to do that. You have to get work. You have to do mid, mid work, right? So yes, that's why you do that. That's why you call work this. Yeah, but then you need this amount of work. You need much more. I don't know. Well, of course you might leave. So in, in principle you you might need some. Uh, of course, even if you switch on the lab, of course you will need much more much more energy than that. No. So this is somehow the work that goes inside the system the change of energy of the system. Or if you want, if you trust one of the two, then the other one must be the correct one, if you want, because they sum up to the variation of energy. Uh, but yeah, so these are just canonical um, definitions, and actually some, there is some part of the field in thermo that's trying to justify these things or uh, argue that the correct definitions are different. So this, this one somehow is... Uh, yeah, the most the most commonly used. Oh, that's why you can only switch something that can with the Hamiltonian because you're not really using energy. I mean, if you're not using mm -hmm. energy, you need a battery. So then you use something that can with the mm -hmm. Hamiltonian. Yes, or you can do it adiabatically, like adiabatically is low in time. Uh, I don't see how this connected with the, the, the Horvetskis, for example, formulation. The what, sorry? Horvetskis, like Michal Horvetskis. Uh -huh. right? I mean, I don't think it's picking up yeah. the same. Yeah, I, I, like I, I, I'm not an expert, but I, I think I, there are some works that try essentially to map this formalism into a formalism with like really a battery system. That, uh, but yeah. Okay, okay. yeah I mean, so the idea is changing the Hamiltonian itself is not free, you know, but it's, it's, but it tells you how much it costs to go into this formula. Yes. Yeah, I'm not buying this formula, but, but, but that's my point, right? Yeah. I mean, if I want to connect it with the fact that you can lift a weight or whatever, mm -hmm. you can all right yeah so okay yeah so uh, let's say we we accept these definitions and uh, okay then if this is the general framework what is the general objective of, of, of a machine well typically you want to use the machine to extract some work or to cool something down or one of these things so I'm just in very vague terms. I, I would say there, there will be some figures of merit that can be the power of the machine or what is normally called the efficiency of the machine. You might try, you might want to maximize the power or the efficiency or any trade-off between them, right? And typically, again, I'm just uh, going to sketch some 
pictures, I'm, but I'm going to be more precise later. Um, for each way, for each, you choose one way of um, cycling your machine, so which means you just choose one value of the control parameters in time with some period tau. This will induce a, a steady state of the machine and some operational mode of this machine that will give you, in, in some plot, uh, a value of the power and a value of the efficiency of such machine. And you can imagine of trying to do this for in, in infinitely many different ways, and you will get many, many dots and many values of power efficiency, but in general you cannot get any power or any efficiency or any power and efficiency at the same time. So you will get some, some kind of um, region that you can explore in this way. And usually, for, I mean, intuitively speaking, the more power you want, the less uh, the, the efficiency that you can get, and so on. So this region, being able to somehow to, to uh, define this region is, some, is what we call solving the optimization, in the sense that we know for example, for each of these points, uh, what to do, and we know that you, we cannot do better than that. So the points on the border of this region are called, this is called Pareto front, and it means that if you are on a point here, you cannot do better both in power and efficiency. If you want to increase power, you have to give up efficiency or vice versa. So this is more or less, yeah, yeah, this will change by case by case, of course, but uh, this is just the vague, uh, uh, the vague objective, okay? if you care about these two trade of uh, optimization. So let's start off, yeah, this was uh, very uh, hand wavy. Um, so let's, uh, let's start from the, what we, we know. For example, in uh, what thermodynamics uh, was born because there were, um, there were many universal results that somehow people uh, found, found out. And all these results somehow were assuming that the system was at equilibrium all the time. So you can imagine, for example, a transformation in which you transform H, you have your system rho that actually corresponds, well, this is your system rho, and there is a, a subset of, of, the, of the set of states that just tells you that rho is thermal. Okay, so it's just a function of H in a way. So you can do transformation on this manifold of thermal states in which you just move correspondingly um, with H. And this is usually obtained when you wait a long time. So if, you're, uh, if your transformation is very slow compared to the thermalization time scale, these are so-called quasi-static transformations or equilibrium transformation. And in this limit, we know that, for example, um, the work that you invest in the system in a transformation like this will correspond to the change of free energy. So this is just uh, classical thermodynamics. And you actually can, you can verify it if you just substitute this. Uh, and oh, yeah, the free energy is defined as uh, the internal energy minus the, the entropy. And you can just verify that, that this thing indeed holds if you, as, if you assume this definition of energy and work and the state to be thermal at all times. So this is, this we recover in the, also in quantum thermodynamics. And or for example, from these same uh, equations, you can also see that the variation of entropy tells you how much heat entered the system. Okay. So, and for example, well, this, this is very universal and very nice, and you can do, for example, in, in case you have more than one temperature, you more than one bath, you can start doing cycles, for example, right? So let's say you have two temperatures, and what, what is a Carnot cycle, for example? A Carnot cycle is a cycle in which you, you do an isotherm starting from some Hamiltonian x to some Hamiltonian hy at equilibrium, then you switch uh, uh, to a different bath and also to, um, to, a different, to a different temperature and to a different Hamiltonian that is just rescaled in order, to, um, in order to have the system at equilibrium with the new bath. So this is some ratio like 
to over T1 in order to remain at equilibrium. Then you go back. And in each of these transformations, there is a, an exchange of energy, an exchange, uh, an exchange of work, and, and heat. And so what do you get if you do this transformation always at equilibrium? You, you get a cycle in which, in each isotherm, you get, well, you can, uh, you can imagine, for example, the power is, is, this power is this, is exactly zero, <laughs> because you do it infinitely slow, right? The efficiency, well, for this kind of cycles, efficiency is normally the, uh, it's just the, the work output divided by, as a, as a fraction of the, of the heat that you absorb. So we know that this is, uh, right? And, uh, ba -ba -ba. yeah? Yes, and you, you, you can say that this is the Carnot efficiency because when heat is exchanged only during the isotherms, and during the isotherms, you get that delta Q is T delta S. So when you com just compute the, uh, here you get essentially T uh, H minus T C over T H. just because all this heat is given by T delta S, essentially, right? So this is quite uh, uh, universal, but at the same time, it's quite useless <laughs> in the sense that, uh, yeah, you get this maximum efficiency and uh, the power is zero, right? Because you need to do these transformations in finite time. So somehow we want to look at what happens when you do transformations that are not in, uh, in, infin in infinite time, right? Yes, maybe I put it here. So you can imagine that these, these two equations here, these are obtained when uh, tau, the time of the transformation, goes to infinite. So you can imagine that one way to possibly go inside a finite time regime is to perform perturbative expansion. So which one should the parameter be? Well, this goes to infinite, so one over tau is the parameter. So we do expansions in one over tau. One over tau has some dimensions, actually, so it's not really uh, uh, well defined in this way. So the, the, param the expansion parameter should be the relaxation time, the thermalization time divided by tau, the time of the tau. Tau is just the duration of the transformation. So you can take a transformation and you can rescale it just in speed. So this is, uh, you can, if you send this to infinite, it goes infinitely slow. Right? And you can imagine that then you will get corrections to these equations because these equations, they, uh, uh, they come from um, equilib the equilibrium case. So for example, this is actually the second law of thermodynamics. That in the, in the, infinite, in the equilibrium case goes to zero, but in the, in the, in the, in the finite time case, it becomes an inequality, right? And y given that this is uh, an expansion in one over tau, we can imagine that actually the first term will be in uh, one over tau term. So we will get delta Q is equal to okay. It, it will exist some coefficient that that we just call sigma, and that with scale, uh, uh, the relative term with scale uh, as one over tau, right? And this will give you the correction, the first order correction in one over tau to the, to the second law. Or another way to say it is that if you want to invest some energy uh, in your system, 
in order to make it change um, to make it change the it's in it's uh, free energy you will you will need to to spend more essentially okay so we we have these uh, first order corrections and okay so th this was um, somehow uh, just I just assume that you can get this, but there are ways to, to, to derive these corrections. So maybe without going too much into details, one way, one, yeah. So one, just to give you an idea of how to, how to derive this, uh, these coefficients here, sigma, you can just write down the, the, uh, the equation for, what, what is the work? So the work is the integral So this is just the integral of the previous definition that I gave for work. And you can imagine that in, in finite time, so if you if tau goes to infinite, rho is at all times just the thermal state. But when tau uh, decreases, you will get corrections to rho. So I just call them rho 1 plus rho 2 and so on. And, and all these corrections, these will be order 1 over tau. And these will be order 1 over tau squared and so on. So to compute actually these terms, you, you have to compute the corrections to the dynamics. And the first order correction in general will be this one, like right? row one. And how, how do you compute row one? Um, so you, you write down the equation for row. Well, this is just a perturbative expansion, right? Row dot is uh, Limbladian on row. And then you know that row is the, the zero uh, order term plus first order term plus so on. You substitute it inside this equation. All right, and now you see that in order to, to have an equality here, you have to match the different orders, right? So for example, omega b is order zero. The, the derivative is order one because the derivative scales as one over tau. So this is order two, for example, because it's the correction to that. This is order one. And you see that indeed order zero, the equation at order zero is simply the Limbladian on the thermal state being equal to zero because it has to be the, 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 the steady state. So to get the first order correction, you have to take these two terms. This is known, and this is known, and this is what you don't know, and somehow you need to invert this Limbladian, okay? Which is, uh, well, there are some technicalities going on, but because this in, is not invertible in general, but uh, this is more or less the way, the way it works. So you get, for example, that that, yeah, for example, rho one is somehow the Limbladian, some inverse, uh, some special inverse of the Limbladian applied to, to the thermal state, okay? So you can derive this. You put this inside here, and, and you get an equation. Yes, so I will. Yeah, sorry. So you match the different orders in the equation. So if you look at order one, what you get is this. Like these are the two terms. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes. Um, is this typically analytically solvable, or would you do it numerically? It depends on the Limbladian, but so if you are if you are able to diagonalize the Limbladian, for example, it is right. So, for example, many times people just take as a Limbladian, uh, you know, 
I love rho. Sometimes people just take a simple exponential uh, thermalization, something like this, so that just exponentially relaxes to the to the. And then the inverse here is quite easy. It's just one over gamma. Um, but yeah, it depends. Yeah, in general. Um, but in general, you can compute it. Like typical Imbladians, you can diagonalize. For example, typical Imbladians that satisfy detailed balance, you can uh, diagonalize. OK. So, th so this is just to somehow um, uh, claim that these, um, how to say, this empirical expansion can be derived. It's not. Uh, Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So at each time of the of the Hamiltonian that you of, like the Hamiltonian varies in time. Yes. So it's changing also with the Hamiltonian. Yes. Okay. So you have to be inside the common like Markov approximation for this. The um, if you when you derive a Limbladian, typically you have to there are there, there is a certain hierarchy of time scales. And you have to pay attention in order to, I mean, in this case, it's not too much of a problem because anyway, we are looking at the case in which tau is very large. So you can imagine that the time scale at which you change the Hamiltonian is much larger than all the other time scales involved here, which are like the thermalization time scale. So the Limbladian rotates together with the, with the Hamiltonian somehow. Um, yes, but it's true, you have to like I'm, I'm using a simplified picture here. Um, yeah, so just just to say, so somehow this is what I wrote here is the content more or less of I think this paper here, um, which is just this slow driving technique. So, so when you slowly drive system, uh, you can do perturbative expansion and obtain all these quantities. Um, yeah, so the thing that matters here is that you get a contribution here that is somehow somehow the work that you would get in the quasi-static case, which actually corresponds to the variation of free energy, and then you get the first order um, correction, which is just this integral of 1 over tau dt. Now I'm just going to write it as uh, rho 1 h dot. Okay? So this is this whole term. You can see that it scales as 1 over tau because this is 1 over tau. This term is also 1 over tau. And then there is an integral from 0 to tau. So overall scales as 1 over tau. And this is how you get this this uh, correction term. Okay. All right. Now, so once you have fixed your uh, your uh, trajectory here, you can, without changing anything else, you can just scale tau. So you can imagine that somehow this coefficient sigma is fixed and you just play with the total duration of tau. And the picture now is, for example, is a little bit like this. So previously you were performing a Carnot, um, Carnot cycle. It looks a little bit like this, where the isotherms were at equilibrium. Now the isotherms are slightly out of equilibrium. And uh, you can write down again a Carnot cycle and what, what, what changes now, right? So now you will get a work output that is equal to Q1 plus Q2, which is simply TH. Sorry, maybe I call this with the same. So heat case and cold case. 
minus h. So now let me write it with a minus. So here the change uh, in sign between the two temperatures is given by the fact that delta s is the same with opposite sign during the two isotherms. It doesn't fit here. So this is the this is the the, the total work output with these corrections. You can write down the efficiency and the power. Well, let's say you write down the power. Let me also assume now that these two coefficients are actually the same. Okay, this is not always the case, uh, but it just simplifies the, the discussion, and it, you can actually do same calculations when also when these are not the same. So you get the power to be somehow T H minus T C delta S. Uh, Okay, so this is just the power. This is the power. And efficiency similarly is well, you get something like 1 minus um, you can just rewrite it and you get something like something like this. Uh, okay, you just get correction terms. Now, now let's fix sigma and delta s. So the transformation is fixed, but we don't fix the, the speed of the transformation. So it means that we can play with tau h and tau c. And this means that, for example, what you, you can do something, for example, you can um, maximize the power. Or you can fix the efficiency to be at some value. You know that the efficiency, it's actually, you can see it from here, that it will be smaller than the Carnot efficiency. You can fix it to some value of the Carnot efficiency. So if you fix eta to be uh, some fraction, uh, let's call it alpha, of the Carnot efficiency, this will give you a relation between tau h and tau c. So there is still one free parameter. And you can then maximize the power with this constraint. So you can actually solve this. It's not uh, difficult. I have it written somewhere. Yes, and you get a result like this. That for the maximum power, um, So you get an expression for the maximum power at a given efficiency, right? And OK, so you can see it makes sense. For example, if you want to go towards Carnot efficiency, it means that this alpha goes to 1, and you get 0 power, so more or less. So there is a trade-off between the power. And, uh, and actually, if you plot this thing, so the maximum power for at any given efficiency, It really looks like what something that I was sketching before. It really looks like something like this. So when you reach Carnot efficiency, you get to zero power. And then there is an efficiency at maximum power that, in this case, is the, it's, it's famous. It, 
to be known as this curzon alborn efficiency. Um, it's similar to the Carnot efficiency, but there is a square root, so it's, uh, it's smaller. Um, yeah, so s somehow you see that already this, uh, well, this perturbative approach allows you to simplify a lot the, 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 the problem and allows you to get some results that are not universal, as universal as, as the second law, but still uh, fairly general. And uh, you, yeah, you can even get an analytics out of it and reconstruct partially this, uh, this um, what, what is called here Pareto front. This is not exact, right? Somehow it is supposed to be exact um, in, in certain regimes. For example, the regime in which you are maximizing in this area here, you are trying to maximize efficiency and you, go that to maxi you know that to maximize efficiency, you need to go as low as possible. So in this area, you know that this is quite valid. Yes. And actually, it's not clear. Well, maybe from here it's kind of clear. But you see that um, this is the this delta t here times delta s is the quasi-static um, work output. And in this case, in, in the case in which th and tc are quite close to each other, this is quite small. So the, the quasi-static work output is quite small, and at the same time, the, you see that this scales as delta t, and this scales as t. So this term, in case delta t is, um, is uh, small, this term is quite big, and in order for this to be overall positive, you need to dump a lot this term, so you are forced to be in the slow driving somehow. So when delta t is small, uh, the slow driving is kind of forced to be there if you want to optimize the... Hey, can I ask a question about this sort of uh, simplification? So, I just let me sneak it through to have this to say this. So when, when it's not a quasi static, you, but at the end of the thermalization stages, uh, you might not be in a thermal state. Yes, right? yes. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you should. The thing repeats in the cycle, does it get further and further away? Or does no, you, you should, in general, you have to be careful to, the, so these are additional correction terms, yeah. but you can neglect them, essentially. Yeah. Or, or if you pay attention, you can neglect so them. Or what, sorry? If it's slow, but not infinitely slow, it might still be approximately the, the, the same each cycle. Like so even, even so in, in the limit of many cycles, anyway, you, you reach a, a limit cycle in any uh -huh. case. Right. Um, the thing is that this limit cycle doesn't coincide with the equilibrium cycle, but it's still a cycle, so it will be periodic after, uh, after uh, more or less the thermalization time scale. All right. So this is somehow without doing much. Uh, right. It, this is just the power of this one over tau scaling that allows you to 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 um, essentially get these kind of results. At the same time, these results that still depend on the trajectory that you chose, right? So the trajectory that you chose tells you what is the delta s, the, the, the variation in entropy between uh, the endpoints, and this sigma that is computed like this. Now, I'm noticing that I'm going already uh, slower. So um, I will just keep here, for example, this. And we know from the second law of thermodynamics that this uh, term sigma here must be positive because it's the first order correction. Otherwise, we, we would get a, an inequality in the other side in the second, uh, in the second law. And actually, if you, if you expand this, this term here, we saw previously that rho, the, this correction, is somehow a function um, some kind of inverse of uh, the derivative of the steady state, right? It was something like this. 
Now, the steady state depends on h, as, uh, as Miguel was commenting. Uh, so actually, this can be seen as, a, as an object that is somehow, let's call this operator uh, j. Uh, this object is linear in h dot, OK? This is just a linear operator, OK? And so you see that actually this becomes something like the integral of some uh, linear, of some quadratic form, if you want, in j, in uh, h dot, OK? And even if it's not clear, you should be from here, of course, uh, but you should be convinced by the second law of thermodynamics that this is really a quadratic form, in the sense that this is, uh, well, it's uh, bilinear in h dot, but it's also positive definite, OK? So actually, this uh, defines a metric uh, on the set of uh, Hamiltonians. And actually, this can also be translated to as the same way w omega dot is a function of h dot, also the, 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 the reverse is, uh, is true. So this can also be written as trace of omega dot with some other operator here, uh, omega dot a quadratic form in omega dot. Um, but anyway, from maybe from the control point of view, given that, uh, if you remember, we say that we assume that somehow h is a function of some uh, param <coughs> parameters that I can control in, in my lab. So you can, you can think of it as something like this, where these are operators. So these are operators, and I actually control only the lambda. If this can be rewritten just by uh, lifting it to, to these uh, variables here as the integral of some, uh, of some metric on, the, on, the, on my control parameters. OK, so this just can be translated on the manifold of uh, control parameters that I have. So this tells us two things. Uh, well, an immediate reaction to this is that uh, if you apply uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, this is immediately larger than 1 over tau, the integral of So this integral, where you see now this is just a, a displacement that doesn't depend on time. So this, this integral is really only on the, on the, on the manifold. It, it doesn't depend on the actual uh, time derivative. So it just tells you somehow this is, it's not clear here, but what I, what I wrote is essentially just the, the integral of some displacement, some speed in time is just larger than uh, 1 over tau, the integral, the, the total length squared divided by the time. So it's just uh, And also, if you want to minimize, so this tells you the optimal way in which you have to, to, to drive your system. But somehow, you might want to know also what is the optimal path. And of course, the optimal path is the one that follows the geodesics according to this. To this. Right? So if you are able to solve the geodesics equation according to this metric, uh, then you essentially, well, you didn't solve fully the problem, but you know how to minimize this sigma. And for fixed delta s, now I, I erased it, but uh, both, I mean, it's kind of clear that both the efficiency and the power increase as you decrease the, 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 these uh, dissipations. So, so this is what, what, what is called uh, thermodynamic length. And um, so it's essentially this length here that uh, quantifies how much you spend for a transformation in uh, measured in uh, dissipation. OK? So it is something. But actually, OK, this is kind of partial optimization. We know how to somehow we 
first we chose how to choose optimally tau h and tau c. Now we also know how to opti optimally choose the trajectory between the endpoints of the transformation. Somehow the only thing that is missing is how to optimize uh, even the endpoints of the transformation, right? Then we would have solved completely the problem. And actually, it, it, it turns out that you can also do that in a way. So you see that everything uh, to solve completely the Pareto front in this limit, so this profile here, the only thing that matters in the end is this coefficient, right? This delta S squared divided by sigma, because all the rest here is fixed. And now, let me check on time. Yes. Um, yes. We can try to rewrite this, this object. Okay, so this is the object that we want to maximize. Now, delta S is just a, uh, uh, how do you call it, function of the state. So it just depends on the endpoints, really. But somehow, I want to rewrite this uh, as an integral. And it's actually easy to write it as an integral. It's just the integral of the gradient of S. So the gradient according, uh, the derivative according to my control parameters in time. Well, uh, as you can imagine, here, here we, we did already time optimization. So the, the endpoints, these are just the endpoints of the transformation divided by this sigma that, in general, will take this form. Um, yes. So maybe I, I write it like in a, in a vector form. OK, so this is a matrix here now, and these are two vectors that are. Yeah, in time, in, in some a dimensional time that just tells me the, about the you can take a time that goes from 0 to 1, essentially, just by rescaling globally. Or even 0 to 1,000, it doesn't really change the, the result. So you can have a second value probably, right? Like a generalized second value probably? Uh, yes, but it, there is actually a much simpler way to, to, to solve this. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe let me just Right. So mat uh, M is a positive definite matrix, so I can take like the square root and this. Yes, and this you can rewrite simply as, uh, so you have the gradient of S, then let me just uh, insert here M to the minus one half, and M one half. Just the generalized kind of anybody problem. Just a, huh? This is how you solve the generalized kind of problem. Ah, okay, then I didn't know. Um, so it's lambda dot squared, and this is, so I'm just gonna say that now this is, um, scalar product. So this is just, if you want, the norm of this vector, right? And this is the scalar product between this vector and this vector. So it's, uh, so this is the norm of, uh, of this vector, the norm. And this is delta S uh, m to the minus 1 scalar, same vector, right? Squared. Right? So, sorry, I, I, mean, I messed it. But you see that now you can just apply cauchy schwarz inequality. And then according to cauchy schwarz uh, 
Yes. And so this is, I'm going to write it here. This is smaller than just the integral of of this, because this is the norm of this vector. OK, and now you see that <laughs> some, some, some magic happened because lambda disappeared somehow. It's, uh, at least lambda dot disappeared, because the values of s and m, they still depend locally on lambda, right? Uh, because lambda defines the point in which I am. But again, now very simple inequality. This is just less than the maximum value of this number over all possible uh, states and lambda. So this is OK. Now, yeah, so you can think of maximum over lambda, right? So now this. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you can always do that. Sorry, I, I, I was a, a little bit sloppy. But you can re use, rescale everything from 0 to 1, uh, which is also why when you define sigma, you define it in this way. Like you say that the dissipations are in this form. Like, uh, because somehow then you rescale already everything with time. and. Um, Yes, so now you just need to solve a scalar maximization. And this give, gives you overall the bound. Remember, this is to bound this number. And once you bound this number, there is nothing left here, essentially. Um, not only, you know, wherever we put an inequality here, here, and yeah, here and here, we know how to uh, saturate that inequality. In particular, this inequality is saturated if you never move too much away from the maximum, this one. And this one is saturated on according to cauchy schwarz which means like moving in some direction. Like the, the, the vectors can, should be parallel in some given metric. So this actually, not only this is a bound, but this can be saturated. And even, you know even, even how. So this tells you the kind of cycle that you should perform. And yeah, so just to appreciate, we started from, from a problem in which you have power and efficiency that in general are functionals of, uh, of lambda of t, right? Um, so in principle, you should perform variational calculus and, and all of these things. And then you end up with actually a scalar maximization that is much more uh, manageable. Of course, in the, mi in the, in the middle of the, uh, of, the, of the trip, we did some approximations. Um, so this is one thing. Now, yeah, maybe I'm going too long on time. I just want to mention uh, a couple of things without going into detail. So what I presented is uh, essentially these two works here. Now, in, a, in this work, in a slightly different scenario in which you cannot detach from the bath, so you imagine you have two baths from which you are always attached, but maybe you can uh, change the, um, the, the strength of uh, the coupling that you, that you have with the bath or the direction of the, of the couplings. Yeah, well, so, so maybe you, you see this delta S squared actually is more like a delta T delta S squared. by sigma, and this is actually, so this figure of merit can be replaced by this thermodynamic length squared in, in, the, in the optimal case. Well, this in, in, uh, in certain scenarios, you can, not only this, is, this you can interpret it as a length, but this you can interpret as an area squared. So uh, essentially, the problem of maximizing, say, efficiency or power is translated into a geometric problem that is known since the ancient Greeks, which is what is the shape that uh, 
maximizes the ratio between area and length. With a sm slightly small problem that in general the metrics that you get inside here is, uh, are complicated. Indeed, if, if it's not the Euclidean matrix, it's not an easy problem, right? Uh, but still, it takes this uh, geometric flavor. And then I think I'm going over time, so maybe I, I'll just stop here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, somehow. So what I did not present, because I was slow, um, is um, the opposite limit. So this was the limit in which tau is very large. And somehow it's supposed to be good in the limit in which you are, you are close to, to high efficiency in this limit. In the, to go to high power, usually, well, there, there, there is no proof, but in certain cases there is proof. There, so there is no general proof that in, to go to high power, usually you, you have to go in the opposite limit. So tau very small, right? And then when tau is very small, there are other geometric tools that, are, uh, that uh, allow you to simplify the maximization, which again brings it, bring it to uh, like a scalar maximization again. Yeah, so as I, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, this doesn't need to be quantum. All, everything that I said, you, you can just redo classically. Instead of a Limbladian, you have a master equa classical master equation, and that's it. It's, it's, really, it's really just the same. And uh, yes, I mean, for calculations will be different. So somehow, you, everything that I said applies to any case in which you have any kind of machine that has some, uh, some ideal output that you, that you have in the, in the limit on infinite time, and then it has some dissipation. And you put yourself in the limit in which the dissipations are small to this one over tau, so you go slow, essentially. So it doesn't need to be, therm not even thermodynamics, but I would say thermodynamics is just the, <laughs> the most uh, reasonable example. So I think it depends on wh what you do, but I think you can, it's not, it's not too difficult to prove that, yes, you just need one jump, at least in some easy cases. Two jumps. Huh? Yeah. Two jumps. Two jumps on the yeah, yeah, one, uh, one sw uh, like, yeah, two temperatures, yes. So there are, uh, yeah, there are also other cases in which you can assume that there are more than two temperatures, but then you can prove that you just need, say, the maximum and the lowest temperature, so depending on what Yes, yes. So it's yeah, no. At least in this scenario, it's kind of clear that only one, uh, only two jumps. Yes, one square, yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot.